Good evening, and welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. My name is Sandra Splinter Bondurant, and I work here at the UW Madison Biotechnology Center. On behalf of the Biotechnology Center and our co organizers, the Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW Extension, we thank you for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. And it is with great pleasure this evening that I am able to introduce Tricia Andrews and Marianne Fairbanks, two researchers who weave their expertise together from far different fields. Tonight, we'll hear how these two are developing a fabric that can harness energy from the sun. Tricia Andrew is one of our assistant professors in the Department of Chemistry and Material Engineering here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Tricia earned her BS at the University of Washington and her PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Tricia is a director of the UW Nanostructured Nano Spintronics Lab, which strives to produce emerging electronic technologies on unconventional substrates by using organic materials to achieve unmatched control over processing. Marianne Fairbanks is also an assistant professor here at the UW-Madison in the School of Human Ecology. Marianne earned her BFA at the University of Michigan and her MFA at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. She has shown her work nationally and internationally in venues including the Museum of Art and Design in New York City, the Smart Museum of Art in Chicago, and the Museum London in Ontario. While working in Chicago, Mary Ann also co-founded an experimental culture space called Mess Hall. Mary Ann continues to produce new 2D and 3D work for her exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Mary Ann Fairbanks and Andrew Tri and Tricia Andrews this evening. I love that this is called uh, Wednesday Night at the Lab, and I feel like a bit of an intruder because really, for me, it'd be Wednesday night at the studio. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about my, uh, my entry into this collaboration, and so to begin, I'm an artist trained in fibers and material studies. I explore intersections between the materi materiality processes associated with textiles and sustainable design. My formal training is in textile-based processes, but my conceptual understanding of materials and their meanings has often led me to do more interactive and politically-based work. Working with others has allowed me to realize projects more ambitious than I could have achieved alone and has enabled me to develop projects for spaces outside my studio and audiences beyond the art community. Looking back at some of these early projects and collaborations provides a bit of context for how a solar textile, um, a current research project that uh, marries sustainable energy, chemistry, and textiles has become the focus of my research. Uh, one of my first explorations into alternative energy was this project called Transform Transport, and it was uh, Installation produced collaboratively with Jane Palmer um, under the moniker of JAM. The installation was conceived and created collaboratively, but also required active participation of the audience members to fully realize the work. The gallery was located in the West Loop of Chicago in a neighborhood deep with a rich history of unionized labor. With this history in mind, we became interested in how we could translate the collective labor of people power into something immediate, visual, and poetic. To do this, we adapted six bicycles to become um, stationary. And each bike was rigged with several electronic, electric generators, kind of the old school kind that still go on the back of your bike, um, and attached to wires uh, and small lights suspended above and around the bikes. The lights illuminated with people-powered rotation of the tires. When one bike was ridden, many lights twinkled. And if all six bikes were ridden simultaneously, the collective work of the riders created a shimmering and brilliant constellation. JAM continued to investigate alternative energy in a public art exhibition in Columbus, Ohio, called Dispensing with Formalities. We were asked to use this newspaper dispenser bin as a space to locate distributable art. With JAM's contribution, called Sunlight, we sought to distribute light 
To make this light dispenser self-contained and capable of both collecting energy and distributing light, we reached out to a local solar engineer who helped us rig the dispenser with solar panels and batteries. Our hope was to distribute the immaterial and perhaps provide light in a space that was unlit, like a sidewalk or overlooked by the city. Having completed two relatively simple technology integrated alternative energy projects, we were driven to do more, not only to better understand the technologies, but to explore the meaning we could plumb to develop conceptual projects around alternative energy. After working with solar, uh, with a solar engineer who not only helped us to create the work, but also taught us the basics of how to use um, and collect solar energy, we felt empowered to continue working with solar and found flexible thin film solar panels were um, on the market. This led us to create this project called Personal Power. It was a project in which we embedded flexible solar panels into garments and bags. And in this case, I like to call this the Michael Jackson jacket, but it was just a jacket that we found at the thrift store. And so it was kind of, you know, very low tech, the first, the very first prototype that we came up with. And we sort of embedded these small thin film panels and covered them with clear vinyl and hooked it up to a Game Boy. So that tells you a little bit about the electronics we were dealing with at the time. Uh, uh, this project was politically motivated and was developed around the time of the run-up to the Second Iraq War, when we were thinking about um, people power in a literal sense. Feeling powerless in our country's decision-making process, we started talking about ways that we could bring power back to the individual. Because we felt that our war was driven, this war was driven by our country's greed for oil, we wondered about ways that we could use solar power on a scale that could, could enable each one of us to be independent from the grid. From our initial con conceptual art project, we realized that we wanted to sort of push it further. We, we showed this, these prototypes in a few places, and people kept saying, well, where, where do we get this? How do we, how do we buy one? And we said, what do you mean? It's art. We're artists. Um, but slowly, we sort of thought about how we could transition this into a product and that maybe to have its full um, conceptual stronghold that we did need to manufacture it and see if we could get it on the market. So uh, we decided to sort of shift our goal into making wearable, portable, alternative energy widely available. Our goal was literally to empower people, to give them personal sources for power, enabling them to disconnect from con conventional sources and tap into a larger network of information through their electronic devices. We look to integrate flexible solar panels into garments, backpacks, and handbags to create mobile power units for devices such as cell phones. It was our hope that by integrating solar power um, into items that people already use, they might be more interested in using solar power on a larger scale. To make this transition from art project into manufactured project, product, we partnered with the MBA um, students at the University of Chicago in their School of Business. Being two artists, we had no idea how to start a business, but we knew how to make stuff. So um, basically, with that team, we were able to develop a business plan. And um, much like here, we went through like a course called the New Venture Challenge. I think there's something like this here in the business school. Um, and so through that, we um, crafted a formal business plan and incorporated as a business called Noon Solar. And this is one of our first lines, and this is our first website. With Noon Solar, we sought to bridge the gap between technology and fashion. Given the, uh, given the relatively high cost of technology and materials, we set our sights on making this a high-end product for an urban consumer, consumer targeting tastemakers. We had competitors addressing the sporting market, but we were looking for a different kind of trendsetter, an early adopter of technology, a fashionista, and an eco-conscious consumer who could use his or her apparel to collect power. Though we disbanded the company in 2010, our design for incorporating solar panel into the handbag and capturing the energy was awarded a US patent in 2013. To collect uh, the sun's light energy, we used this flexible thin film photovoltaic panel. While the thin film panels were at the, that we integrated into noon solar bags were at the cutting edge of the commercially available solar technology in the early 2000s, they still had rigidity and size limitations. Aesthetically, it was always a challenge to figure out how to integrate the rectangular thin film into the design of the bag. I always dreamed of a solar conductive surface that would cost less, could offer more flexibility, and that would, wouldn't have the size limitation. What if the fabric itself could collect the sun's energy and be seamlessly integrated into the bags? And so this was the question sort of that I positioned when I first met Tricia, so I will transfer to her.
Can you hear me? All right. So you heard Marianne and her um, dream to actually integrate power harvesting technology into things that you wear or things that you carry. And I think that is the ultimate um, you know, first step toward actually looking at a new energy future because you're divorcing yourself from thinking about having to look to a wall outlet in order to actually power your lives and your electronics. And you start small, right? You start with a cell phone, you start with Fitbits, you start with something that is disposable. And then eventually when you kind of mentally divorce yourself from having to plug something in, then you actually can transfer human sociology into actually you know, thinking about different ways of generating power. But all the examples that you've seen and part from Marianne's own businesses are very clunky. So effectively, it's a, it's a technique called patching, right? You take something, you cut a hole into it, and then you fill that hole with something that is rigid because every electronic that you deal with, that you're used to dealing with, is inflexible. So think about an iWatch, right? It's just a watch strap with a hole in it, and then you basically stuck a portable computer in that square hole. And that's all you're really able to do because electronics need a you know, rigid background. You can't bend them. If you bend your phone, you break it. Um, and that's what I basically disagree with. And in sp specifically with energy harvesting techniques, so uh, when you look at these are just a random collection, non-exhaustive collection of um, Google images that you get when you type in solar fabric, OK? Um, and you get these ridiculous images of solar panels on a necklace. Um, you get some images from defunct companies that never got off the ground. Um, and then you get a few interesting images. For example, this is actually from a defunct DARPA um, defense organization project trying to um, disperse solar panels in, in active theaters of war. And this is a, a real company that existed for a microsecond that was trying to sell these solar tents to, again, the Department of Defense. And I want to actually zoom in on that image for a little while. So you look at this and you say, hey, there are kind of solar fabrics out there. Look at that. That's a solar tent. Those are silicon solar panels that are kind of flexible that are integrated into this tent material. But notice what I told you before. The only way you could do that is to patch something in. You cut a hole in a tent and you patch in a flexible solar panel. Why am I focusing on that? Well, when you actually think about this tent material, this is some amazing ingenuity in manufacturing and advances in textile manufacturing. This is not a cotton fabric. This is a polyester blend that has been highly engineered to withstand gale force winds. And that's what you want. That's a, it's a tent, right? It's a tent that's protecting you from the elements and protecting soldiers in, in very discrete conditions. This is a flexible silicon solar panel, but that has completely different technology. I can take, as an engineer, a silicon solar panel that you have maybe on your rooftops on glass and make it, put it onto a flexible plastic sheet, but that doesn't mean that actually can withstand gale force winds. It means it could withstand a bending angle of 10 degrees when it couldn't, it could only withstand a bending angle of zero degrees before. That is a completely different set of mechanical stress that so you're placing a tent in versus a silicon solar panel. And this is what that image is here for. So when you fold this tent up, what you notice is you actually can't quite roll it up like you would this tent. This tent without the silicon solar panels fits in the backpack, the 80 pound backpack of a, sol of a soldier, of what Marine carries on his back. You suddenly patch in a silicon solar cell and you can't really stick that in his backpack anymore. So you've really proved a point, but you haven't actually helped um, progress the narrative of how to generate power in remote locations easily, all right? And so why haven't people done that, obviously? Because, well, fabrics are tough, right? Fabrics are rough on so many levels. First to the eye, this is a weave pattern. This is, these are all scanning electron microscope images. Um, but this is a weave pattern that you could see or even feel with your fingers. Um, so there's multiple levels of roughness on a centimeter scale from just the weave of a fabric um, and then there's also multiple levels of possible roughness within each fiber composing that fabric itself. And what I'm not showing you here is a further zoomed in image of that fa uh, individual fiber, depending on whether you have silk or cotton, there could be multiple levels of fuzziness, let's say on the nanometer scale within that individual fiber itself. And this is why you can't grow a solar cell directly from the substrate because you have to traverse the roughness on a fiber level to a collection of fibers, then to the weave, right? That's ridiculous. 
Well, I, we hope to tell you that it's not as ridiculous as you would think. And the answer to that is actually to invoke a little bit of organic chemistry, which you would never think to invoke when you're trying to make a device. But here we are. So this is a technique that we use in my lab that we call chemical vapor deposition. In general, that's a very common technique in the electronics industry. That's how you actually make thin films of silicon. It's a chemical vapor deposition. It's a very generic term. What we're doing is actually conducting organic chemistry in the vapor phase, and that is not as common. In fact, there's very few people who do that. And so I'm first going to tell you about this reaction here. The structures are small because I don't want you to get bogged down in too much chemistry. But you basically start with a single structure like this. This is a liquid at room temperature, and it's called EDOT for ethylene dioxythiophene. And then if you add a reagent, iron trichloride, to ethylene dioxythiophene, you make something called polyethylene dioxythiophene, or PDOT. Okay? So going from E dot to P dot was a solution polymerization that was reported in 1983. This is a very, very, very well-known reaction. Its kinetics are incredibly well understood. Um, the role of the iron trichloride catalyst is really well understood as far as the chemistry is concerned, completely worked out. Um, and also P dot, how to make films of it, different versions of it, um, is very well understood. And P dot is interesting here because it has the conductivity of copper. So if you make a wire of P-dot, if you're actually are able to make a film of P-dot, it has the same conductivity as a metal in the wires in this building. Okay? So P-dot was first made in the early 80s because it was an organic metal. So what we did was basically take this very, very old chemistry, and we said instead of doing it in solution, as most chemistry is conducted, uh, we're going to do it in the vapor phase. And we're going to do it in this chamber here. So this is from my lab, and this is a schematic of what's happening in this chamber itself. Um, the box is basically a vacuum. Um, the vacuum is a few millitor tens of millitors, okay? Um, that's kind of what the vacuum you have in your fridge when you shut the door. And from the left, we're going to introduce the E dot monomer in the vapor phase. And then on the bottom of this vacuum chamber, we have a crucible where we have our iron trichloride catalyst. So it's the same two molecules that we have from the solution polymerization, monomer E dot and the, and the catalyst iron trichloride. The only difference we're doing here is we're not using solvent, and we're actually introducing the monomer in the vapor phase from the left. And then we're also heating up the catalyst from the bottom. And so in this center region, roughly speaking here, the catalyst and the monomer vapors are going to physically mix. This is simple mass transport dynamics, if anyone's a chemical engineer in the audience. Um, and in this mixing region, basically, we could stick whatever substrate we want. Um, and because we form P dot based on this chemical reaction, P dot is a polymer, as I mentioned. Polymers are literally heavy. Um, and so even though you have a millitor vacuum here, the polymers are just going to coat everything in sight. And now, since this, is a, since this is a very simple mass transport issue, by controlling the degree of the vacuum here, you can actually control how far the polymer travels before it adheres to a substrate. Okay? So, what all this, what I really want to focus on, the, the advantages of this procedure, is that whatever substrate you stick in this mixing region, all right, we're going to get something called conformal deposition. There's two kinds of depositions out there, conformal and line of sight. Line of sight means whatever it hits, line of sight, it sticks. Right? Conformal means kind of conforms to whatever curvature of the substrate you put in there. So here is, again, another SEM of, I believe this is cotton. Um, I'm not sure, but it doesn't quite matter. So this is a collection of fibrils of cotton, let's say, um, before deposition. And then this is the same sample, different set of fibers. I can't quite say it's the same. But it's the same sample after deposition of P dot un under the vacuum. And what you see is you get a little bit of roughness. That's because we have our P dot deposited on the surface. But what you see is the P dot uh, conformally coats each one of the fibers. And where there is an empty space between the fibers, you don't see any polymer. Uh, you follow the curvature of the fibers itself. If there is a break in the fiber, you see that as well. Okay? So whatever fabric sample we put in this chamber, in this mixing region, we get completely conformal deposition simply by putzing with a few knobs and basically changing the monomer flow rate and the vacuum of our chamber back here. And so what you can end up doing is get over those multiple levels of roughness that I just told you would absolutely preclude the formation of electronic substrates or devices on a fabric substrate. So here is some silk materials. This is a larger scale, 100 microns. This is 20 microns. So here you can see the weave pattern. Here's the individual fibers. This is the sample before deposition. This is a sample after P dot deposition. 
Um, you can tell the difference. There, there's, it's kind of hard to tell, not even sure if you can see the resolution, but the coded samples uh, under normal light look blue because P dot, um, when you form a thick enough film, actually looks very deep navy blue to the eye. Um, but you can also see the roughness here in the SEM. But note the amazing level of control that we have, and we're really not even trying that hard. Um, we have the P dot that coats the fiber, again, conformally, but even when we have the different woven pattern, we're not even coating individual threads and then weaving a pattern afterwards. We have our pre-woven fabric substrate, and the P dot, again, conformally coats all of those weave patterns as well. So we can effectively take a woven material and deposit P dot on it. Um, why do I keep looking at P dot? Well, again, like I said, P dot is an organic metal. It has a conductivity comparative to that of metallic copper. Um, and so just to kind of prove my point here that we can actually use P dot as an organic metal, um, these are collection of fibers that we got from Marianne. So one of the advantages of working with a weaver is that you get exposed, I mean, you think about things like, what kind of fiber should I use? And she gave us a sample of these two materials that are pineapple fabric and banana fabric. So pineapple fabric is the um, material that, is, that forms the national uniform of the Philippines. And these are both what she tells me are bast fibers. So they come from the leaves of the pineapple and banana plants, respectively. And so you just dry the leaves and pull them apart, make a fiber, and then you could weave some uh, very gauzy uh, uh, clothes out of them. And what you're seeing here are first optical microscope images, so you can kind of see the blue color everywhere. You see the slightly blue-green pattern that is because it looks slightly blue-green to the eye. And these are some SEMs. Um, this is before deposition. This is after deposition, again, to show you, again, the conformality of this process. And then these bottom two images here, if you can't see the numbers, they're basically voltmeter readings looking at the resistance of this one-inch sample that you see um, in both of those images. And these are one inch square samples of these banana or pineapple swatches cut out. And these are two alligator clips that are traversing that one inch square. And what you're seeing is a resistance value of about 305 ohms. Um, if no one knows the resistance of a typical fabric, it's so resistive that you really can't get a reading. So it's above a few giga ohms, okay? So all of a sudden, just because of the P dot coating, we've actually made this textile conductive. And it's so conductive that if we actually coat a few fibers and make a little yarn of it, um, connect it to a light bulb, we can actually power a light bulb. So that's what this picture is, is this right here, this black part. Um, we're not really great photographers in my lab, but this black part are banana fibers that are actually passing enough current density to power a normal incandescent um, light bulb. Or, well, it's not normal. It's a tiny light bulb we found lying around in the basement of the chemistry building. Um, OK. so. We use OCVD, again, to basically make textiles conductive. So they can actually serve as a bottom substrate, as a bottom conducting electrode for whatever device that we grow on it. Now, if we're talking about solars, solar cells, we have to grow the rest of the device. We just had the conductive substrate, but now we actually need something to collect light and convert light into power. So let's talk about that bit. So um, now we have the conductive base down here. Sorry, this is a bit repetitive. So let's talk a little bit about what are the solar collecting or photoactive layers that we're going to use in these, in these devices. So again, we need to think about flexibility. We need to think about um, whether we could use silicon, I suppose, because we still have a conductive material. We just do need to do a little bit of Fermi level matching. But we could use silicon, grow microcrystals of silicon on our fabric substrate now. Um, and make a solar cell that way, okay? But again, we hit up that problem of flexibility and how much you bend a material. So silicon is very, very um, sensitive to even micro cracks in the system. So even if we have a conductive fabric substrate, if I grow silicon on it, um, first of all, silicon's grown at about 400 degrees, so my fabric is gonna burn. Uh, but if I somehow got around that chemically, um, even if I grew silicon crystals from the ground up, if I bent it, more than 10 degrees, it's going to become unusable again, OK? So even to think about our photoactive layers, and partly this is my own bias. I like organic materials. That's what my lab focuses on. Um, we use organic dyes as our photo collection layers. Um, one of the dyes we use, one of my favorites, Unfortunately, we don't use this a lot these days, to be perfectly honest with you, but this is one of our old standbys, is copper thalassinine, the structure shown there with a few missing bones. Um, but it's a very, very famous um, pervasive dye because it used to be a blue pigment, 
um, largely for the car industry, but you don't really see blue cars anymore, actually. I don't even see green cars anymore, but uh, that's an aside. Anyways, it's still anything that's blue and plastic has copper thiocyanine as its, as its pigment, okay? Um, blue paint, uh, wall paint, plastics. And um, this is made in about 35 kilotons a year in 2012. That number is about the same even in 2016. It hasn't changed too much. And elemental silicon is produced, or I'm sorry, copper thalassiony is produced about 75 kilotons a year. Silicon for electronics is only produced in about 35 kilotons a year, all right? So there's, this dye is actually manufactured in almost double the amount that silicon is, is used. And the reason is you can actually make this in one simple step from phthalic acid, which you get from coal tar. Um, and so uh, it's really a really very easy reaction to set up, and so you can ma mass manufacture this. Another common dye that we still use in my lab very often is this structure called, uh, shown here. This is called PTCDI, or paraline dye imid. Um, this is famously known as Ferrari Red. Um, this is a picture of its powder, and these are different solution images. Um, my student, I didn't know that my students were actually working with this, to be honest with you. I just found these images in our group camera, um, and you can see why. There are, there are a ton of fun to work with, so these are just images of various solutions of this material under room light. They're so fluorescent that you can actually see the fluorescence under just normal fluorescent light bulbs. But this is Ferrari Red, and we use blue car paint again. And it turns out that when you think about the science of these materials, when you actually make a thin film of them, um, I'm talking about 50 nanometers thick, um, single human hair is about 1,000 nanometers, right? So very, very thin films. When you think about a thin film, the physics of these materials actually are very similar to that of silicon. That's how we can get away with using organic pigments. These are effectively molecular semiconductors. And when I teach this in class, you can actually make a direct analogy to a unit cell of silicon, that's what's actually shown here, um, to a unit cell of one of these dyes. This is another blue pigment called pentathene. Um, silicon basically has a covalent bond between two silicon atoms. In pentathene or in any organic semiconductor, you just have one extra step. So instead of atom to crystal, you go from atom to molecule to crystal. All right, so you just have an intervening molecular step. And what you have is the bonds are Van der Waals forces between the molecules as opposed to covalent bonds between atoms. And that weaker Van der Waals interaction between molecules has one main advantage and one main disadvantage. The disadvantage is that since it's a weaker bond, you actually have um, higher resistivity or lower conductivity in these systems. But because this is a weaker bond, you can actually make these films on absolutely anything at room temperature. Okay? And so obviously it's the advantage that we're going to take use of um, in order to make solar fabrics. So you can make a ton of flexible devices. The slide is a little bit busy. Don't worry about the band structure here. Just focus on these two pictures. These are another two sets of car paint pigments. This is a blue paint. Um, this is actually inkjet printer paint called DBP. This is American red instead of Ferrari red. This is actually a, a red dye that was discovered at the University of Michigan and used um, because of its proximity to Detroit in um, American red cars. That's why it's called American red. Um, but these are the two dyes that we use that actually form a photodiode or a solar cell. And that's what this image is showing you here. It actually functions as a solar cell. And this is an image of my students' fingers and the solar cell deposited on a flexible PET substrate. Okay? So again, we could take these organics and we can make them flexible. But I told you you could kind of do that with silicon as well. Um, and there have been other people who have also made flexible plastic sheets um, using organic compounds. But as I introduced this before to you, fabrics are a whole different degree of mechanical instability than a simple flexible plastic sheet, okay? Um, I think I'm just gonna skip this first. So let's think about how we actually, can we deposit these materials on fabric? And the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? Um, so it turned out it's actually pretty simple. So this is another SEM. The light images are where we have our organic molecule and then the dark images are actually just the background fabric itself um, with some burn residue there. I think my student went a little bit too hardcore with the electron gun of the SEM. But these are some real life images um, that were fancy images that were taken by a photographer for the alumni magazine. And then here is a schematic of what's happening here and then the, again the SEM. And what I really want to focus on in the SEM is, again, you don't really see a lot of difference between the uncoated versus the coated fabric. You don't really see a lot of crystal clustering, even at um, this 200 micron um, scale uh, image here. 
you don't see a lot of non-uniform coverage that kind of jumps out to you in the eye. And what this image is telling you is basically that these organic photoactive molecules that we're using are able to, again, coat a very, very rough fabric substrate without any breakage, all right? So we can actually use these dyes as we wish on a fabric substrate. So now we have our bottom conductive base. We can either use a copper fabric or we could use a PDOT coated stuff that I talked to you about before. Uh, we have our photoactive materials. If we use organic compounds, they can actually also coat the fabric itself. And then um, on top, the last bit, our last uh, electrode that completes our device, these squares here are a transparent metal um, or transparent material, excuse me, called indium tin oxide. We can also end up using some uh, metal vapors like silver and actually complete um, our device. And I'm going to give this over back to Marianne to talk about our next venue of where we're going to go to think about a new manufacturing technique. When I showed up at Trisha's lab, I guess over a year ago now, I, I, I brought a bunch of fabric, a bunch of textile swatches, I brought my bags, I brought a bunch of samples to, to try to convince Trisha that I thought this was a good idea. But in, in, in the end, what I was really hoping for was that we wouldn't maybe just coat these textiles with the process that she had already developed on the paper, but that perhaps we could weave them from the ground up. So, I felt like that was the craziest idea, and I barely wanted to mention it because I thought Trisha would, uh, you know, think I was crazy. But in the end, it, it seems that there's a real potential for this, and, and I think we're both really excited about this potential. And so, what what could happen here is what you're seeing in this image is is this loom. It's called the Thread Controller One Loom. It's uh, a new digital technology in in looms that is related to the Jacquard loom. So the Jacquard loom was made in 1805 and was uh, based in a series of punch cards. Um, and so that, that technology has sort of existed and we, we all have cloth that has been woven on, on something like this. Anything that's sort of fancy or floral has been woven on a Jacquard loom. This technology has existed primarily for us uh, as an in industrial technology, something that's been manufactured very apart from us as makers or as weavers because, you know, we don't buy thousands of dollars worth of equipment in looms. Uh, I would say 12 to 15 years ago, this loom came on the market. It's called the Thread Controller One. One it's made in Norway, uh, by, invented by a woman named Vibika Besby. And what's exciting about this tool is it's, it's really a rapid prototyper for textiles. And so as a researcher or as a, an artist, uh, people are now able to buy this loom. Uh, when it first came on the market, I think it was about eighty to $100,000, which is still very expensive. <laughs> but uh, already in the last 12 years, the price has come down significantly. Um, right now, we're using this original model, which is called the Thread Controller 1. I've just uh, received a grant to get something called the Thread Controller 2, which is much improved from this version. But what you're seeing here is a thread that has individualized control of each and every th thread that's there. So there's 1,760 threads that I can design a weave structure for in a program and send it to the computer. <coughs> Often people think that the loom then just weaves it for you, and that's absolutely not the, tr the case here. Okay, if I did it in an industry situation, yes, it would be weaving it for me. In this case, I am physically still throwing the weft back and forth. I have control of the design. I can change it immediately if it's not working. And so with this loom, the idea is, you know, when we get to the point where Trisha can coat any of the threads and all of these different components that she just ta talked to you about, that then we can weave the structure, weave the panel from the ground up. So we're not coating it anymore, that we're building it through a weave woven process. And so uh, this is sort of the future that we're hopeful about. Um, we have just started initial testing with this. We have not gotten very far, but this new loom uh, that is coming on its way, hopefully very soon, uh, will help us to, de to realize this part of the, our research. So um, we're very hopeful that uh, the manufacturing will, will maybe go in this way. And so this, this sort of shows some of our ideas about um, how this cloth could come together. So basically what you're seeing here is you, you just saw the components that are, are important for layering in that first system. But here what you're seeing is that we would individually coat these threads and then intersect them, whether it's in the warp or the weft, to create a pattern. 
right? And so when these uh, conductive threads are intersecting or when the, when the coded, uh, dye-coded threads are intersecting, they're, they're creating the device within the, the woven cloth itself. And so, again, these are just mock-ups of the idea, but the, the idea would be like, maybe we'll weave a small unit and then every 10 inches we could cut it and that is the panel. Maybe we're weaving a you know, whole bolt of 50 yards of cloth and that is the panel that goes on the tent eventually. And so <clears throat> it becomes really exciting to think about sort of the implications for this. I think one of the reasons that solar technology, you know, even back when we first used those flexible thin film panels, we, I thought, oh, the price will come down. It's, there's going to be radical change in this market really soon. And it's been, you know, 15 years probably since we first made that sample. And I, I would say that that technology is still probably the most innovative technology on the market today. And so being a part of something that we can maybe transform the future of this um, feels really exciting. And so uh, we are hopeful that this will be the future of textiles and the future of technology. Because to make it flexible means, you know, like Tricia was saying about the tent, that there's, there's unlimited potential for where this could go. Say, think of sails, think of tents, think of... Uh, anything that you could unfurl and ship anywhere around the world for, for a very low cost. And so that's another goal of, of mine. And then finally, just as the design side of this, um, I get really excited that because Trish and I are collaborating, you know, there's certainly the scientific part that has to come to fruition and, and be successful. But the design part of it is really exciting to think about because I don't think these things ever truly get developed simultaneously. And so if I can start thinking about you know, my research involves looking at uh, textiles and uh, the use of metallic threads in textile, in historic textiles. Metallic threads over time have been very expensive, so they're used very sparingly. And so what are those designs and how are they efficient with those designs and how can we think about sort of those past designs and how that will feed into this, um, the future of this research. And so I think there's a design element that feels really exciting as well that these two things, the design and the functionality, can grow simultaneously. Well, actually, I'm up here mostly to, um, <laughs> to, to thank the people who actually did the work here. Uh, but what you're, just to explain this diagram a little bit more, um, what, we're, what, you're showing, what I'm showing you here is this concept where basically we have our conductive threads, and then the red and blue are supposed to be the two, again, dyes that we put out here. So the idea is we marry the two techniques that I showed you before of using OCVD to make something conductive. So that would be the gray fabric. And then we just use our organic dyes that I also showed you before, coat individual threads. And so instead of having a pre-woven substrate that we just coat the four layers on sequentially, the idea here, the crazy idea here, is that we actually coat, we deconstruct the four components of a solar cell, the two electrodes and the two photo collection layers, and actually coat them on four separate threads. And Marianne is actually going to marry them either in a very simple yarning technique here where we just literally twist everything together and everywhere we have a twist intersecting, that's where we actually have an electronic interface as well. Or you actually marry it by a weaving pattern, that's what's shown here, where we have these two are electrodes and then in this case the yellow, green and the blue are our two photo collection layers. And so the solar cell basically um, functions through this first electrode down through the blue and then up back to the second gray electrode here. And that's what these two cartoons are really showing you here. And in this kind of scenario, we're basically going to be using metal threads. And this is where we've had the most success. Um, and you actually think this kind of idea is, is crazy, but to just go back here, where um, in a very simple fashion, we just took a pre-woven substrate and we just nanoscale coated our device over us. Um, if you actually, I'm not really sure why I don't have these JV diagrams for you, but if you actually just measure the single individual solar cell separately, you actually, it works as a solar cell. It's not very efficient now, um, but you actually can convert sunlight or white light into power with about 1% efficiency. And for comparison, um, these materials that we're working with on glass, so taking away this flexible textile substrate component, we should get about 5 or 6% efficiency. So 1% is actually not that bad. Um, and the slide I skipped over, actually, let me perhaps go back here. So um, these are not on textile, so this is some other work that um, also happens in my lab. So these are some flexible solar panels that you see in the back. Again, remember that I told you we're not great photographers. Um, 
So that's the flexible solar panel back there. And this is actually a PV array. Um, and so this is one of them cut out. So each one of these individual squares is a single solar cell. And in this line, this is effectively a kind of string of Christmas lights. And so this is a line of series connected individual solar cells. And so, in, and the whole square um, is a mixture of series and parallel connected solar cells. And overall, they make an array similar to the big solar panels that you see on your rooftops if you have them, or certainly by the traffic lights on university. And the interesting thing about these um, materials, again, the organics that we use, um, as shown in the still here. So this, is, this picture is taken in my office. And this, again, is a module over here. And that's my student's hand. Um, and what you're seeing is a voltmeter here showing that we can generate one volt with this array just under room light. And the reason I'm focusing on the room light bit is when you have a silicon solar panel, or if you have a tiny photo detector, um, and you take it and you expose it to just white light and even an auditorium, you're not going to manifest a photocurrent. And that's because silicon is really good at transporting electricity, but it's really, really bad at collecting light. And you need to actually have a particular angle, and that's why solar cells are installed the way that they are at an angle in order to collect the most light. And in fact, if you can also find some flexible silicon panels on the market, on niche markets like Amazon if you want to, that allegedly charge your cell phone. But the reason these kinds of technologies are not widely used is because if you actually take it out, let's say on a normal Wisconsin winter day, even if you unfurl the whole panel, chances are 50-50 that you're actually going to generate enough power to even power a Fitbit. Okay, it's just, just because silicon solar cells are not user friendly. They don't actually collect light very well. You need to have them delocalized in a particular way, hitting sunlight at a particular angle, and you need to have a little bit of focus light from the sun in order to actually get a photocurrent. We don't have any of those limitations with organics. And another way to think about them is when you think about try, just trying to dye something, forget the electronic part. If you just want to make something colorful, what do you use? You use organic dyes. Organic materials just collect energy light energy a lot better. They absorb it better, right? So that's what this slide is really here to show you. Um, and I think, I think this is a movie. I forget what this is showing you, other than my squealing voice, which I actually have muted, because you don't need to hear that. Um, but you can actually see, oh, that's sorry. We're going to turn off the light, and you actually see the voltage go away to actually show you that we are manifesting um, the light from just my office, the fluorescent light in my office. So. Ideally, where we're going to go with this, again, as, I, as Marianne introduced this concept to you, is we're going to take these deconstructed threads, the deconstructed solar cell, and we're going to weave it together. And as opposed to this idea where we just grow the solar cell array on a piece of plastic, and plastic can be destroyed, let's say, um, and we're also limited in the way and uh, the kind of array that we make over here by my physical uh, deposition equipment. With this idea, when Marianne is actually going to weave the solar cell together, we can actually, each one of these squares forms a single cell. All right? And so this fabric actually has an order of magnitude more silicon, or it's not silicon, solar cells present on it, simply because at every intersection we have an actual device compared to the one that I showed you on, on plastic. And so this basically opens up so many more venues for us to actually generate a um, small area high power uh, piece of technology that can give you um, power. So I'm going to end there. It's a little bit early, but I'm happy to, we're both happy to um, entertain questions. But I just want to thank the people working on this, especially this woman here, Lu Shui. She's just an amazing student, and I just like everyone to know that. Um, she's started this work um, about six months ago, completely built our chambers, mastered the technique. Uh, mastered a whole bunch of different chemistries to make this uh, solar array, and then worked with this other woman here, Yu Lin, who's actually the, whose hands you see in the background of that movie making the um, plastic solar arrays. Um, but this has just been an amazing group of people that I've had the, the fortune to cobble together, and this is my lab. Um, and these people for giving us money, and uh, thank you for your attention and the invitation to talk here. So 